Hi, it looks like we're back. So today, they are a threatened species, and they are protected by the Federal Endangered Species Act. So Silver Strand State Beach and the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve are seasonal nesting sites for the western snowy plover. Nesting season is March 15th to September 15th. So that's right at the time when people are also most using the beaches. Um, let me show you a plover. I'll try to get up close so you can see. This is an adult, and he's got breeding plumage. Um, they have a white belly and a tannish gray top, and they have year-round black beaks and gray feet. But during the winter, they don't have this black, these black spots and stripes. This is breeding plumage, and they'll lose that in the winter. So during the year, some of them stay here year-round. Others of them choose to migrate. Um, they, when they start to nest, they nest in loose colonies with the least terns, which are endangered. So that's when you see our fenced areas, they have endangered least terns and snowy plovers in there, which are threatened. Um, sometimes they will nest in an isolated layers too. So they're not always in a group that you might see. Um, so when they nest, they will reunite with their mate from the season before if they can. And they also have site fidelity, which means they'll come back to the same nest if they can. Um, plovers nest on the ground. And so they might nest in a footprint, which is, you know, kind of a natural depression. And they might have to make the nest. So the male makes the nest, and it's called a scrape. It's just an indentation in the sand. And the way he does it is he takes his chest and his back feet, and he'll go around in a circle to make that little bowl, which is called a scrape. And then it's decorated with pebbles and uh, shell and vegetation fragments. The female picks which scrape she wants to use as her nest. Let me show you. This is the snowy plover egg. Eggs. They, they can have two to four, but usually three. Both the female and the male sit on the eggs to incubate them, the female during the day and the male at night. And you can see how camouflaged they are. They're this buff color with brown spots all over them. And then you can also see these cute little babies and how spotted they are. They blend perfectly, camouflage perfectly with the sand. Um, when they hatch, they're precocial, which means they're up and running right away. So it takes them about three hours just as their down dries they leave the nest, but the first one to hatch will wait for at least one of its brothers and sisters to, na to, to hatch before it leaves. Um, so again, they're precocial. They can run and swim, but they can't fly until they're four weeks. Um, at that time, the female actually leaves the babies. And she goes on to find a new mate and make a new nest. And she tries to get three nests in a season. Well, the male stays with the chicks. And he doesn't, you know, he just broods them occasionally. And two of his jobs are to call when he sees danger. And so the babies will flatten themselves in the sand so you really can't see them. Or they'll run behind some driftwood which is a reason that it's important not to take things home from the beach. Um, another job would be 
they don't have to feed the chicks, but they do lead them to food. And uh, plovers are visual feeders, so you'll see them at the beach doing this thing where they stop, look, and then they'll run after their prey. And they eat the flies in the rack line. A rack line is where the seaweed gathers in the um, tide line, the high tide line. And so they eat those flies, and that's why we don't rake our beaches. Another thing, they can, you know, use their foot to um, kick up some beetles that they'll eat. And they also, in the wet sand, probe for crustaceans and marine worms. So in four weeks, they'll fly. And then the male goes on to get a new, a new mate and start a new nest. So during that period before I Biologists come in and put these metal bands. Closer. Okay, so they put these metal bands, this colorful bling on these chicks. And they like these um, colored IDs because they're easy, they're easy to see an ID from a distance. But because there's only so many color combinations, there's, so many there's not very many variations. And so a lot of sites are using bands that have flags with alphanumerical codes. Um, so you may see some with flags as well as just colorful bands. And what these bands tell us is it tracks their age, it tracks their migration patterns, their site fidelity, their breeding success, and ultimately their survival. Um, plovers can live up to 15 years. The oldest one was 15 years and two months, I believe. But typically, they only live about three years because life is hard here at the beach. Um, our Local winter population here is 459 birds, and our breeding population is 295. Um, but more telling of how many adults are here is, is how many chicks survive a season. So this year at Silver Strand State Beach, there were 28 nests and only four chicks survived to fledge. And at the Tijuana Estuary, we had 57 nests, but only 18 chicks made it. Um, <clears throat> the problem for all endangered species is first and foremost habitat loss and frag fragmentation. Here on the beach, we also have people, dogs. You can see how many vehicles with all the tracks. And when the adults get frightened, they run, which exposes the chicks to predators. There's house cats, coyotes, um, skunks, possum. Um, so that's a fair amount of predators here. Um, but the good news is that you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to save this species by simply following a few rules, which I'll repeat. Um, keep your dogs on a leash. I mean, I have a boxer. I like to run him at the beach, but not here. Not with the plovers and the, and the least turn. Because even if your dog isn't a bird dog and doesn't care anything about the birds, he's still going to scare him, scare them. And um, you don't want to fly kites or frisbees because that looks like a raptor to a bird and will frighten them. You don't want to leave any trash on the beach because it attracts those predators. Um, you don't want to go near any of the fenced areas because, as we saw, they're very difficult to see. I used to want to help band the chicks, but my eyesight isn't good enough, and I'm afraid I would step on one. They are that hard to see. Um, and of course, you don't want to light fires or fireworks at the beach. 
So California State Park has a legal obligation to protect the western snowy plover. And they do issue citations with fines. Um, so you want to try really hard for these cute little guys to follow all the rules so that we can have more babies fledge next year. Does anyone have any questions about the snowy plovers? So there is a little bit of a delay. If you have any questions for Robin regarding the snowy plover, you can uh, type them in now while we're live, or if you're watching later, you can type them in and we will respond to them uh, outside of the live, the live broadcast. If you can hear me. Mar, maybe you want to show the sign and the fencing. Yeah, so we made, I don't know, hopefully you guys can hear me. I'm not mic, but we can see the fencing here, right here. We're at the lower parking lot at Borderfield State Park. This is where the fencing begins. And all that area to the north of us is reserved, is protected for the western snowy plover and other uh, species as well. But, um, and, oh good, you can hear Mario. Thanks, Ann. Appreciate that. And I'm just going to hopefully, <laughs> ooh, the signal is so crazy down here, um, just take you over. First I'll just pan, so I'll show you where we're going, to that adorable respect the fence sign that was part of a project with Audubon and third grade students in a local elementary school here who helped while well, we created awareness, while well, we created awareness about these species, these nesting uh, beach species, they created these wonderful signs to help protect these species here on the beach. And so when you get a chance to visit either the, the beach uh, north of the Tijuana River mouth or south, uh, when it's safe when Waterfield is open again, but uh, you, might, you may see these, or you may have seen them before. And they do some artwork, some awareness, and species and habitat protection all right there. So, Amy, it doesn't look like we have any, any questions. I'm going to flip this. Oops. Back around before we sign off. I hope everyone can, I'm still there. It says we're live. Everyone can hear me. Thank you so much for your patience as we broadcast these lunchtime lives from the Tijuana River Valley and here at Borderfield State Park in celebration of Tijuana River Action Month. All of these have been recorded. There have been many other events during this uh, Tijuana River Action Month, which doesn't even end until October 10th, Saturday. We have a couple of, uh, a couple of um, uh, events left, including one Thursday night at 7 p.m. You can tune into Facebook for the history of Borderfield State Park. And it won't be occurring at Borderfield State Park. It will be it's more of a webinar. So there won't be connectivity issues. And then also on Saturday, we have another community cleanup um, uh, in response to uh, the coastal cleanup event a couple of weeks ago. And that's, you know, in your community, in small groups with your family uh, cleaning up. So please check our Facebook page for those events as well as the Tijuana River Action Network Facebook page for many other events that have occurred or still occurring in the last few days of Tijuana River Action Month on both sides of the border. There are a lot of events on the other side of the border. So thank you. We will be back with Lunchtime Live uh, out of the reserve, out of the visitor center, not next week, but the following week. We can pick up those programs.
uh, back at the visitor center area. So um, I hope everyone has had a great day and enjoying the weather that's starting to cool off now. And thank you for being our Facebook family, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.